all remember the scene with Rose who at the end of the movie has passed away. And the pictures that show she lived a happy and full life after the sinking of the Titanic. Hello, my name is Hilda Maria Hellstrom. I was a third class passenger aboard the Titanic. This photograph was taken in 1903. I am in the center with my father August on the left and my mother Carolina on the right, along with my brothers and sisters. I obtained this visa on March 29, 1912 to leave Sweden and visit my aunt Johanna Erickson, who lived in Evanston, Illinois. At the studio of O. Sundberg, I had this portrait taken of me, and the photos taken of my brothers and sisters was to remember them by. From left to right are Nils, Elsa, Anna, myself, and my big brother Carl. I carried both of these photos close to my heart, and I was so grateful that both of these photographs survived with me. In Southampton, I was informed that there was a new ship called the Titanic. She was about to leave on her maiden voyage. There was a coal strike going on at the time, and they had to plunder the coal from the Adriatic so the Titanic could go on her maiden voyage. This is my inspection card, which shows that I was transferred from the Adriatic to the Titanic and that I was given cabin 135 on D deck, bunk number three. Cabin 135 was at the very stern of the ship. I signed my ticket for the adventure that was about to begin. This is the only known complete set of required documents needed to board the Titanic. I was so excited when I was given the news that I was going to be transferred to the most magnificent ship afloat. I was 22 years old when I boarded the ship. We were cramped for space in the lower berths, but the linens and blankets were very clean and comfortable, and the smell of fresh paint still lingered in the air. I was curious to see the rest of the ship and was drawn to the sound of orchestral music coming from above. I made my way up through the second class level past men in a room smoking and playing cards. In the movie, Jack got caught roaming the ship. Hilda was never caught in her numerous escapades throughout the voyage. Here you, get back where you belong. We go, we go. In the first class ballroom, I found myself in the presence of wonderful music. I remain there unseen by anyone. The music Hilda heard on board the Titanic was very lightly coming from Wallace Hartley and his band. Here is the sheet music belonging to Wallace Hartley that was recovered with his violin 10 days after the sinking. It is on display here at the Museum on Catalina Island and the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C. This is a third-class menu found during the body recovery effort. Hilda would have used this menu on April 12th at the halfway point between leaving Southampton on the 10th and the sinking on the 14th. On the night of April 14th, I heard strange noises and went up on deck. I didn't see anything and it was so cold I went back down to my room. Feeling that something was wrong, I reached for my coat. My friend Velen and I went back up on deck where we were grabbed by someone I didn't know who. SOS, we cannot last much longer. Engine room full up to boilers, sinking fast. If such were correct, she would be in heavy field ice and numerous bergs. Open trust matters are not as bad as they appear. We were led forward past Wallace Hartley where his band was playing calmly. Velen and I were ushered into collapsible lifeboat sea surrounded by total chaos, since this was the last lifeboat to be launched on the starboard side. Bruce Ismay was helping passengers into lifeboat sea, and as the lifeboat started down, Bruce Ismay jumped into our boat.
Velen and I noticed Bruce Ismay never once looked back at his magnificent ship. Velen brought a bottle of brandy with her that we shared to calm our nerves as we watched the Titanic slip beneath the surface of the Atlantic. We arrived at the Carpathia just before 6 a.m. on the morning of April 15th. On our rescue ship, the Carpathia, we were stowed like pigs. We received a stress signal call from the Titanic at 11.20 and proceeded right to the spot mentioned. On arrival at daybreak, we saw ice, 25 miles long, apparently solid. Quantity of wreckage and number of boats full of lives. We raised about 670 souls. Titanic has sunk. She went down in two hours, captain and all engineers. Our captain sent order that there was no need for Baltic to come any farther. So with that, she returned on her course to Liverpool. We have two or three officers aboard and the second Marconi operator who had been creeping his way through water at 30 degrees for several hours. Mr. Ismay is aboard. Carpathia is full of passengers. Now she has another 712 rescued from the Titanic and very limited space. The Olympic, which looks identical to the Titanic, has offered to take some passengers. Captain Rostron on the Carpathia believes it is not a good idea for Titanic survivors to see an identical ship. Do you think it is advisable Titanic's passengers see Olympic? Personally, I say not. Mr. Ismay orders Olympic not to be seen by Carpathia. No transfer to take place. They were afraid Titanic's passengers would not like to see, let alone board, a ship that was identical to Titanic. Kindly inform me if there is the slightest hope in searching Titanic position at daybreak. Agree with you on not meeting. We'll stand on present course until you have passed, and we'll then haul more to southward. Does parallel of 41.17 North lay clear of the ice? With this message, Carpathia sent Olympic on its way. There are a few photos of icebergs around the wreck site. No one knows for sure which was the iceberg she hit. I arrived in New York broke, pale, and skinny. A page from the Survivor's Manifest shows my entry is on line number 8. Here, I am in New York with fellow survivors from Lifeboat C. That's me in the middle and second from the left. I was given $25 from the Women's Relief Committee to purchase clothes and food. Very thin and extremely tired, I am relieved to finally meet my Aunt Johanna Erickson and John Larson in Chicago. This is the last known photograph taken of me on Easter Sunday in 1961, holding my grandson Stephen Sentko on my lap. On a business trip to Chicago, I stopped by the cemetery where Hilda is buried and was surprised to find no headstone. At the office, I was told she was buried in plot 515 and that I could place a headstone with the family's permission. I managed to find Hilda's grandsons, Anton, Stephen, and great-granddaughter, Claire. Together, we designed and then placed the two headstones on the 8th of November, 2023, for both Hilda and her husband, John. Finally, after 61 years, Hilda and John's plots can be properly remembered.
Stephen never saw the headstones. He passed away 37 days before the headstones were placed. So I'm on the business trip in Chicago. I heard he was buried at the Memorial Park Cemetery in Skokie, and I went on a quest to try and find her headstone and where she was buried. And I actually spent, uh, oh, probably over two days, about 40 minutes a day hunting and could not find it. And, uh, and uh, a little, about a year later, I was back on the same trip to uh, Chicago business trip and I went a little further and I went into the office to try and find out where she was buried and they told me it was in plot number 515. So uh, with that information I went out and uh, some of the plot numbers were above ground and some were hidden and were very difficult to find and it took, took me into the second day of about uh, about 40 minutes in the second day when I finally found it and, uh, and discovered there was no headstone there and that's why I couldn't uh, find where she was buried. So I went to the office and I asked why there was no headstone on her site and they did a little research and found that uh, the family didn't have enough money at the time for a headstone. And I just uh, casually asked what it would cost to put a headstone down and uh, they said, well, I, they couldn't do that no matter what, I would have to get permission from the family just in case, you know, there was issues with religion or whatever was said or done to the headstone. So then I went on a quest and uh, I, came, I finally found uh, Anton Senko and uh, his brother Stephen. And uh, I invited uh, Anton to the cemetery. And we took a trip up to Skokie to go to the cemetery. And I had it all planned out with the office. And uh, I brought in uh, Anton into the office and we sat down and we were looking at all the papers, of, uh, all the ledgers and that where she was buried. And then I just, uh, I just uh, purchased the headstone in front of him right then. <laughs> and you said that that's the only known collection of all of the documents. Of every document for one person aboard Titanic. And my belief is why this is the only collection is if you imagine what you do when if you're going, if you're traveling first class, whether it's going to a hotel or anything else, you t and you're staying for an extended period, you take everything out of your pockets and you put it in drawers. And in third class, there was no drawers. Everything was in her coat. And it was a cold night. She put her jacket on when she went out, or her coat, and all, that's how all the papers came off the ship. That's, that's my theory. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> so interesting. That definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 there's no drawers. Yeah. She would have had to keep all of her, you know, her wallet, everything on her. Mm -hmm. um, wow, so, and now could you, what were those documents again? I know you listed them off, but. So there was her visa to leave Sweden. Okay. There's uh, a doctor's inspection card which uh, in third class you had to be free of lice and things like that. They just had this little ritual they had to go through. And her baggage claim and the ticket and the ticket receipt. Wow. So if you had those papers back then, you would have been able to get on board Titanic. It was every piece of document you needed. I guess, I mean, you know, you said Hilda feels like family at this point. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's one of those things that's really hard to put into words. I mean, you know, family's probably not the right word, but I just feel some sort of emotional attachment because I've been, you know, been the caretaker for, of these pieces and I didn't want her name to get lost to history. And, uh, and this is a way to do it. I mean, a, a, a grave site with no headstone, I mean, nobody ever knew who was there, you know, and, and now she's becoming part of, you know, 
history again, people can see our visitor and talk to her and her name will continue on. Yeah. I it, think won't, it won't get lost to history, so to speak. And that's what I'm trying to preserve. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's kind of, I mean, that's what you do with your collection, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. Keeping these no, every single piece has a story and I'm always trying to dig out, you know, the story from every single part of it. And uh, there's, I've found yeah. a few trails, but they obviously, you know, a lot of them end very quickly. This one's actually gone deeper than most. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like neither of you ever were actually able to meet Hilda. She had, she had she passed, passed by. She passed away two years. I was born in 64. She passed away in 62. Mm -hmm. You just at missed her. At my mother's house. Spent the last year of her life at my mother's house, where I grew up. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah, obviously, never met her. Mm -hmm. um, so based on, you know, what you had heard, family stories, obviously you had family. Your mother obviously knew her. <laughs> um, what was she like as a person? So she gardened, she fished, she was, sounds like an, a bit of an outdoors woman. Yeah, raised chickens, stuff like that, in, in her small little yard. Wow. And, uh, her husband, John, was a chauffeur. That's so great. Yeah. I, I know a lot of times our perception of survivors is, you know, we know their life up to April of 1912, and then we don't know anything else. Right. And yeah. we forget to ask questions about anything else. Yes. Now that Hilda, you know, her, her name is out in the light again, literally with the new headstone, um, what does that what does that mean for you guys? What do you want her legacy to be going forward? You tell your story and I'll tell mine. I don't know if you want to hear mine. Oh, for sure. <laughs> That's we can cut it out. We can cut anything out. She's a she's a badass. And uh, she just gotta she keep was. going. <laughs> she was. Um well she yeah, she Never definitely, forget, definitely a strong woman, but I, Did she ever give any details about the sneaking into first class thing? I remember my mother talking about it, and she just kind of snickered about it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no real details mm -hmm. that were relayed to me, relayed to me through my mother or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, just that she did it. And, mm -hmm. In fact, the stuff that's on the internet where she stood there unseen by anyone, that was relayed to her, to my mom, firsthand from Hilda. Mm -hmm. and, so that's that's my mother's first-hand account of. I think she may have been a little bit of snarky too. That's kind of what I got from my mother and other stuff that research with the Tony Prost and stuff. She may have been just they had a little bit of an attitude every now and then. But, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, so no, <laughs> well, rule number one of being a sneaky person is you don't tell your secrets. It's true. It's true. It's true. Just saying. Loose lips sink ships. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 uh, there, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and Claire, I see you have her pin. Is that is it a dove? It, it yeah, it's um a replica that Tony had made for me. Mm. But how uh, does it how does it feel seeing that picture of her on the headstone wearing you know, you're wearing something that she did. You look like her. It, you know, I'm very thankful, and I really appreciate everybody's efforts in all of this. And it, it felt really great to have her finally honored and mm -hmm. get a headstone for her grave. And yeah, uh, I wasn't aware that there wasn't any. I had, I had never been up here to my mother's house mm -hmm. or my grandmother's house. This area even. Been around it, but uh, I was not aware that there was not headstones on their on their graves until Tony Prost contacted me, and uh, he informed me that, and then uh, we just kind of took things from there, and uh, now there's headstones there, and I'm very honored and grateful to him. I have to admit, the first time I came here with Tony before the headstones were placed, that was the first time here. Even though there was no headstones, I knew my grandparents were there, and that was a bit emotional for me. That was, uh, even though I'd never met either one, but yeah, and, and this as well. This mm -hmm. is uh, very honored, and I'm grateful to have this uh, be a part of that little, a small part of that history in our family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for all that, uh, you know, what, what can you say? You know, it's not everybody every day somebody contacts you about your family from quite a ways back and, and, and offers to do something like that for you. 
So I'm, I'm very honored in what she means to um, me. I feel like as far as what she means to me is, I feel like she's kind of, what I get from this whole experience with her and her survival and all that is the strength and ability to move on and to survive and build a family, build a life and carry on despite all odds. Like that's why my favorite joke is, did she survive? No. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes later. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. I, I think it's great that her memory I mean, yeah, she was a Titanic survivor, and she, and she came here and made a life for herself in spite of that tragedy. And you can only a person can only imagine emotionally what and physically what she endured mm -hmm. to get here and do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud to have somebody like that in my in my in, you know my family history. 